You know, once upon a time, we said, trust the science, the method of finding answers. Then came this new study rooted in the scientific method, carefully and cleverly outlining new research. Peer reviewed, approved for publication, and it gave us this rat with giant balls. I mean, they're twice the size of its head. Parts probably needing a wheelbarrow to walk down the street. Hey, maybe size matters, but then somebody noticed in this journal that the words were spelled a little weirdly, like they look like mid-journey gibberish. So how does this kind of work get published and approved? And is science research getting undermined and hurt by AI? Well, ask Wiley, who shut down 19 journals with more retractions in a year than they had in a decade, and the answer is surprising. Hey, this is Declan Dunn of the AI Optimist, where I help entrepreneurs, businesses, and creative types like scientists use AI in simple, practical ways. With scientific fraud using AI-produced studies to shut down 19 journals, the story of publishing science papers and research shows how we adapt to the promise and the negative side of AI. Let's find out why those 19 journals were shut down and why, starting with an easy question. Does AI have any benefit to science research going forward, or is it a Pandora's box? And every day, we discover the fraud is increasing. Though it's still only 2% of what's out there, so this is not the whole industry, but there's danger involved, and scientists are worried. Take a listen. We are reaching a point where we will probably not be able to trust science because we won't be able to distinguish between what's authentic and what's fake. How we handle the danger makes all the difference in AI. The well-endowed rat showed that the peer review, where two others review a science paper for accuracy and comments, didn't even know what mid-journey was, even though it was clearly noted on the research. And all three images in the research were fake, though they did check the science of the published part and felt that that was good. But the journal, Frontiers, just retracted it and just has a disclaimer saying it's really not our fault. We're the publisher. The problem lies with the person publishing. Well, in 2023, retractions like this were a massive leap, like they'd never been before. And Andrew Gray, a librarian at University College London, went through millions of papers searching for the overuse of AI words like meticulous, intricate, or commendable. And he determined that at least 60,000 papers involved the use of AI in 2023, which is about 1% of the annual total. But this is stuff used for other research to be cited. And for 2024, he says we see increased numbers. I mean, 13,000 papers were retracted in 2023. That's massive, by far the most in history, according to the U.S.-based group Retraction Watch, who is a, looks out for these kind of things. AI has allowed bad actors in scientific publishing and academia to industrialize the overflow of junk papers, Retraction Watch co-founder Ivan Aransky says. Now, such bad actors include what is known as paper mills, where they churn out paper research for a fee. And according to Elizabeth Bick, a Dutch researcher who detects scientific image manipulation, these scammers sell authorship to researchers, pumping out vast amounts of very poor quality, plagiarized or fake papers. 2% of all papers, according to her, are published by paper mills, but the rate is exploding as AI opens the floodgate. So now we all of a sudden understand that this isn't just a problem, this is a threat to what we see in scientific journals. Until one day, they woke up and the industry said, what can we do about it? Legitimate scientists find that their industry is polluted by weird fake science sometimes. It hurts reputations, trust, and even stops some legitimate research from getting done and moving forward. In its August edition, Resources Policy, an academic journal under the Elsevier publishing umbrella, featured a peer-reviewed study about how e-commerce has affected fossil fuel efficiency in developing nations. But buried in the report was a curious sentence. Please note that as an AI language model, I am unable to generate specific tables or conduct tests, so the actual results should be included in the table. 
200 research retractions without using AI. So it's not just the case of chat GPT ruining science, but what's happening is the industry is trying to stop this. So Web of Science, which is run by Clarivate, sanctioned and removed more than 50 journals saying that they failed to meet the quality selection criteria and that it has improved, their ability has improved thanks to technology making it able to identify more journals of concern. Hmm, sounds a little bit like AI and it probably is. Well, that's good to do. It's after the fact. It's after we've seen it published. And the key here is how can we stop it before it happens, before it gets published? And how can we encourage scientific researchers to use AI in the right way? We need something to stop it before it happens. And some suggest it may involve adapting the very publisher parish model driving this kind of activity. If you're not familiar with it, publisher parish is a statement that if you don't get published, your career, your science career can really be hurt. So the industry in science and the publication started looking deeply at what was right in front of them, but they didn't understand until our giant private rat and other fake papers put them on red alert. Wait, I got to look for myself. So I went to Google Scholar and I searched for the words, quote, as an AI language model. And the results of the top 10 results, eight, eight had as an AI language model. And if you've ever used ChatGPT, you know what that means. Not only did these people not bother to take out the obvious AI language, there has to be a ton of research of scientific papers that are done by AI, but that people creating them that know to take out the AI words and probably run it by a basic grammar checker so that they can see that it doesn't sound like AI and would pass most things. I mean, does it mean we can't trust the science being published or have to look and say, is this AI hallucinating or is this real science? Because of that, science publishing industry, it started looking at how to detect and create fake science articles to understand how to recognize them. These are scientists. We need a model. We need a predictable model to be able to find the fake models, the fake research. So trust the science, which by the way, any scientist would say it test the science, never trust it, became an ironic statement. How do you trust it? And how do you know if it's not fake? Now this kind of work is hurting the reputation of science, though admittedly, it's certainly not everywhere. Yet a recent study in the National Library of Medicine related to neurosurgery had a goal of creating a fake piece of research that seemed authentic using prompts. And the authors used ChatGPT to create a fraudulent article. If you go to my Substack, I've got it there, links there. Be sure to check it out. It's really detailed. And here are some of the prompts they used. Now there's a number of them. Let's walk through them quickly. First prompt, suggest relevant randomized controlled trial called RCT in a field of neurosurgery that's suitable for the aim and scope of the Public Library of Science called PLOS, which is a nonprofit publisher of open access journals and basically sets the rules of how it's going to get published. Prompt number two, now give me an abstract according to open access articles on PLOS. Prompt number three, now I want you to make the whole article step by step, one section after another. Give me the introduction section, use citations like the PLOS wants, and give me a reference list. Prompt four, I want you to be more specific. Use scientific language. And if you ever use ChatGPT, you know what they're talking about. Prompt five, now give me materials and methods section. These are part of standard research. Prompt six, give me detailed re results section, including patient data. Wow, Mating, hallucinating patient data. Prompt seven, now I need discussion. Compare the results with published articles. Prompt eight, I need the discussion to be longer, at least twice. Compare our studies with similar previous studies. Prompt nine, give me all nine references that you shared there because we need references and citations. Prompt 10, POS Medicine wants an author summary. It should be bulleted. Why was this study done? Prompt 11, give me another two bullets on it. What did the researchers do and find? Prompt 12, here's a results section of an article. You suggest tables to go with it. Prompt 13, can you create some charts? Can you provide a data sheet for creating the charts? 
So the purpose of this was to use this fake article and then go to two AI content checkers. One was content at scale, which says it has a 98% accuracy rate of finding fake AI generated articles. It doesn't always have to be fake. And they found 48%, definitely not convincing. That's 50, 50. So they went to AI text classifier by OpenAI, and that rated the AI generation as unclear. So it wasn't true, but created false research does get through these AI checkers. So I went to Jason Rogers, who wrote his whole master's thesis on deep faking, videos, imagery, used in legal and other systems. And I asked him, what do you see as the biggest challenge in detecting fake generated scientific content and how might researchers stay one step ahead of those creating the fakes? I believe the biggest challenge with AI generated science content is going to be the risk of false positives. So the example that I can think of here is that a lot of academic institutions use like online submission portals, such as Turnitin, Moogle, Canvas, things like that. And these have automated plagiarism checkers inside. Recently, they've also started bringing in automated AI checkers to see if there's any AI generated content in there. It's, uh, I've seen online of people uh, complaining or claiming, sorry, that their submissions, which are 100% original content, have been flagged as having a high content of AI generated media. And it's been then either dismissed or flagged for additional review or they're being penalized for it in some way. I don't know whether their claims are true or not, because I don't know the people and I haven't seen their submissions, so I can't comment on that, I'm afraid. But that this is a potential risk for it there. So in short, I think my, my biggest worry is false positives. So it's clear false positives are a huge challenge and may be happening as the first AI tools aren't that accurate. Still, Jason, will this impact good scientific research in any way? What are some of the risks? It could also become a barrier to stopping real research, especially stuff that could be very useful uh, coming through in a timely manner. It also could be a, a roadblock for other people who, uh, there's always a chance where you may be doing similar research or the same research as somebody in another corner of the, the, the globe. So it could be uh, the difference between you getting your research out there first and then somebody else beating you to it if your work is flagged or dismissed or etc anything like that another risk could be that they could also miss these contents if, if there's a high risk of false positives i believe that there could also be, be an equal risk of the these checkers just plain missing ai generated content and it filtering through into some places which could then lead to fake uh, false information leaking out into industry potentially causing safety hazards potentially causing uh, lawsuits potentially causing just all sorts of bad news for people. AI detection isn't close to perfect. It could stop research or slow somebody down so another scientist is able to get it out first because of a false positive. And because of that, we try to stop it. This is always what we do with AI, stop it. Can AI stop the fraud? Well, listen to Sam Harris on the David Pakman podcast. The AI that allows for fraud is is going to be is going to always outrun the AI that allows for the detection of fraud. Now, Sam isn't really confident that AI can stop the fraud, and there's good reasons. But people are starting to create tools to do this, like Xfake SCI by authors Hamed and Wu. They program Xfake SCI to analyze major features about how papers were written, so they could determine and use this AI tool to figure out using AI to find AI generated content. One is called the number of bigrams, which are two words that frequently appear together like climate change, clinical trials, or biomedical literature. The second feature is context, how those bigrams are linked to other words and concepts in the text. That was the strategy. And the first striking thing to them was that the number of bigrams were very few in the fake world, but in the real world, they were much, much richer. Also in the fake world, despite the fact that there were very few bigrams, they were so connected to everything else, unlike what real world people would do. They theorized that the writing styles are different because human researchers don't have the same goals as AI, prompted to produce a piece on a given topic and basically predict the answer you're looking for. So I went to Jason and asked him, do you think development of tools like XFake, SCI, 
can keep pace with AI advancements, or will we always be playing catch up? I think to an extent, like any technology really, that we're, there is going to always be an aspect of catching up to them. Uh, it's, you see it all the time in uh, like some cybersecurity where uh, they'll find an exploit in a piece of software that they can use to hack into things. It will get patched and fixed uh, by the developers, but then shortly after they'll find another way into it. And I think we'll have a similar issue with uh, detecting deep fake things, especially if we're using uh, dedicated tools for it, even if we're using manual methods for it. As soon as the people creating these tools know about it, the you know, how we do it, how we d detect them, they'll develop ways to counteract already where uh, it was often known where deep fake videos of faces didn't blink. You now that in the early days was a giveaway sign. Now they blink. Now it looks realistic. So they they heard that that's how that's what the giveaway sign was, and they went, let's fix that. Let's make it harder to do it, and they did. They're getting higher quality now as well. In the terms of uh, the science publications, it's maybe not as big a risk as something like videos or audio, media, etc. Especially from the audience where it's coming from. I think there will always be some sort of catch up there though. There will always be an inherent risk that, and people may be afraid to publish their results on how they detect things because of this. It unfortunately looks like it's going to be a part of reality in my opinion. See, the thing I love about Jason, having interviewed him in an earlier podcast, he brings experience and knowledge of this problem from hacking to creating AI videos. It's dynamic and the fraud side has no rules. The AI protection side is limited by reacting instead of creating new approaches like the fraud side does. So like Sam Harris has said, the fraud side almost has an advantage until finally we start developing tools using AI that aren't fakes but help us as well. Just like the earlier examples of the AI fake generated paper to prove you could create it, what if you use a similar process with better knowledge of AI to create real research? Like the project AI Scientist on GitHub has code, templates, and guides to creating novel scientific research at $15 a paper. Wow. Imagining people could use this to come up with cool ideas and speed up research, make the progress faster, and helping them pursue ideas that are great, not average, because it's very important in scientific research to come up with something new that adds to what we know that just doesn't repeat what we know. One of the problems of fake AI research. It only knows what we already know, you know? So there's three levels to AI scientists. Idea generation, where it goes to ChatGPT and LLM for the idea and innovation plan. Checks for novelty to see if this is new against what already exists and does idea scoring and archiving. Then it goes into experimental iteration, a template for experimenting, code via the LLM and an aider, which helps that code and an experimental exec script leading to experiment and update of the plan and numerical data and plots. Finally, it writes the paper using a manuscript template, text via LLMs and the aider, a manuscript is created, and then they have an LLM paper reviewing the whole process. Now, this is new AI and like anything, it's no certainly flawless. There's been a number of people complaining that they don't like the idea, that it goes against what science should do, and that they're finding that the citations and papers are sort of suspect and old, which happens. But this is not a new concept. So while creating AI papers openly is new, transparently, AI has been used to help create drugs for a number of years. Since at least 2020, there have been AI designed drugs. AI is used to develop drugs by identifying potential drug targets and designing molecules that can interact with these targets. This reduces the 10 to 15 year time of development and billions of dollars to a very short period. And it's already led to the first clinical trials and even approval. The first drugs designed with the help of AI are now in clinical trials. Incitico is one that started phase one clinical trials. This is huge, created with AI, not by the scientists, but with the scientists prompting and helping and asking for help on the molecular research. It makes drug discovery faster and cheaper. And the first AI designed drug molecule 
in human clinical trials was in 2020, and the FDA granted its first orphan drug designation to an AI-discovered drug in February 2023. So what we've learned is that we're actually using AI, much like the U.S. Patent Office, which lets people invent things using AI as a tool, as long as it's disclosed. We've been using it to make drugs. Is AI scientists that crazy to say we could create research papers, keep it new, with the human being editing, reading, working with it? I'm not sure what the answer is, but it sure isn't just to try to stop AI, which is one of the common things we've done. And ever since then, we learn, adapt, and improve scientific publishing. Fake science, as I said at the beginning, put 19 publications out of business with over 10,000 fakes drowning the scientific publishing. Now, even that big story of Wiley shutting down all those publications, it was one publishing company that they bought in Egypt, which was using paper mills to churn out papers. The review process was sort of flawed and they had a lot of problems with it. So it really came from one source that out of the 13,000 retractions, 10,000 came from this. But do remember, this is still a problem. There's still 3,000 retractions, which is way higher than ever happened before. So while you see the big headline, know that while it's not hurting us, we don't even know those AI papers research that were smart enough to avoid getting noticed. Because a lot of these papers, as you saw with our well-endowed rat friend, are pretty obvious to notice for somebody who's looking. There's differences in scope that they found, inconsistencies in description of the research, discrepancies. This is great between the availability of data and the research described. I mean, if you don't have the data, you can't do the research. Hey, tell AI to do it. It can hallucinate anything. Inappropriate citations. As you saw in AI scientists, this is a big deal. Citations really matter. They validate the research from history. You can't use old ones. Incoherent, meaningless, and irrelevant content. We've seen that with our big rat friend, peer review manipulation. That's what really happened in the Wiley shutting down. It wasn't necessarily manipulated, but it was flawed. So we have a better understanding of what bad AI research looks like. People can use AI effectively if we know the ground rules and be careful of punishing people for adapting. We need them to be transparent and avoiding false positives because for all of our efforts, it's really hard to make sure AI created anything, especially writing. That one's very difficult for them to pick out. So let's use number one, AI as a tool, just like the US Patent Office said. If it's a tool, you need to disclose it and what level this came from. Let's not hide. Let's use legitimate AI. Let's use it in a way that AI scientists at least intends. But number three, openly state that this is AI generated or AI assisted like AI scientists and those creating breakthrough drugs with AI. But really, it comes down to keeping it human, doesn't it? What we're trying to say is we can't just automate everything as much as the engineers are like, oh, we don't need any of you to create this. Scientists will be gone. You know, that's the promise of AI. It's not. How does it help us? How does it help people? I'm not a scientist and not qualified to say, but it is a common challenge in AI. How do you make sure that peer reviews check it and are aware of AI? Make sure that the human element, the creativity, the innovation doesn't just come from AI, but comes from the dance between us. And to look at things like the rat with a giant penis to wake us up and find out how we can work with AI and not have it push out bad papers and research. This is common in the first wave. Will science, research, and publishing step up? Looks like the early answer is yes, and time will tell.